Acts chapter 24, and as we approach the scriptures, let us pray once more. Father, we pray that you would just help us to concentrate and to focus on what you have for us tonight. We recognize we are in perilous times, but we also recognize that your Son has overcome the world, and we are thankful for that. And it is in the name of your Son we pray, asking that God the Holy Spirit would guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, in Acts chapter 24, we have the Apostle Paul. We're going to uh, consider the conscience uh, in an extended two sessions tonight, uh, probably two sessions. We may move beyond it. Uh, if you remember, Felix, well, he was a uh, procurator. That's kind of like, uh, that would be kind of akin to a, a justice of the peace for us. It would be a little higher status than that, but uh, Felix was in, in an inferior court uh, in that province, and uh, I mentioned a few things that the historian Tacitus said about him. Uh, one of the things that I, I don't remember if I mentioned or not, but uh, he was known for cruelty, and I'm thinking that that may have been because he had been a slave uh, and became a freedman before he was appointed to that position, and uh, people who are enslaved can easily become cruel. Now, he really didn't uh, put the pressure on the Apostle Paul, so that was providential, I believe, that uh, because he certainly could have been crueler to the Apostle Paul, but uh, he wasn't. And so Paul in Acts 24, verse 14, uh, answering to the accusation against him and uh, giving some uh, testimony, some witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. He said in Acts 24, actually I want to go to verses 15, and 16, having a, a, a good translation would be confidence or confident expectation in God, which these men cherish themselves, that there will certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. And he was speaking, of course, to uh, predominantly the Pharisees who were uh, who had gone to the to the hearing? They had lawyered up uh, with a man named Tertullus and uh, gone to the the hearing. And verse sixteen, in view of this, I also do my best to me to always. Uh, let me start again and work on this small print. This is this is my. Bug out Bible. I was uh, saying to people um, at the beginning of the, our time together, in case we have to bug out quick, uh, I just need to remember my reading glasses. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in verse 16, in view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience, both before God and before men. And the word for conscience is sunedesis, S-U-N-E-I-D, long E-S-I-S, in transliteration from soon, with, and ido, to know. And that is exactly what our conscience is. It's, it's to know with. Uh, it's our uh, it, it's kind of like a, a mirror, uh, but it is 
given by God, and it is innate, it's inborn, and it's to uh, give us a moral conscience, to, uh, uh, to give standards of right and wrong to a fallen race and to give believers the opportunity to, or to give unbelievers the opportunity to make uh, good decisions which will uh, help them to be positive toward the gospel when it is presented to them. And as for believers, the conscience is very important as well. It's important that we develop a good conscience, and we'll see that in the scripture tonight. That, in fact, is the goal of the teaching of Bible doctrine that uh, we will have a good conscience and uh, from the instruction will spring forth a good conscience and love without hypocrisy. And we'll be looking at that. Uh, in any case, you could turn with me to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. And in Romans chapter 2 and uh, verses 14 and 15. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. So looking into the conscience then is uh, looking into kind of a, a reflection of the thought processes, but uh, it's also something more. It's, it's something that will give a person standards of right and wrong and a, even a system of values. And the conscience is a very important part of the spiritual life. It's very important with regard to the spiritual life. But thank God, unbelievers have the conscience, which uh, is a smaller light, which uh, can make a person open to uh, that great light, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the conscience then, Paul was writing, causes the Gentiles to bear witness and their thoughts alternately either accuse or else defend them. And I, I would say that today we have uh, people defensive more than uh, being accusing of evil. In other words, we have, we have uh, today a lack of absolutes. We have an environment in the world today of relativity and no regard or very little regard among much of the population of the entire world toward absolute truth. And uh, of course, the absolute truth is the Word of God. And in uh, this word, sunedesis, I'm going to read something from W.E. Vine again uh, tonight on the word conscience. If I had a biblical bug out bag, and, and uh, for anyone who was listening by video or wasn't in on the previous conversation, that's a, that's a bag uh, to prepare for whatever may come to be able to get out quick and have uh, things you might need in some kind of emergency on hand. 
And I, I'm becoming of a, uh, I was never much of a prepper, but I'm leaning a little bit more toward that way uh, in these recent times. But I was thinking recently, of what would I want in my, if I could take a few books from my library, what would I take? And this would be one of them. This is uh, by W. E. Vine. I've had it since Bible college days. It's the Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. It's an old standard. Um, I recommend it for the shelf of uh, every serious student of the Word of God. Um, it, it's very, very good, and I've I've used it as a reference work. It's a, a great basic tool uh, to study the, to help you study the Bible from the ground up, and then it's uh, uh, as you advance in years, it's still a wonderful work to refer to, uh, or to which to refer, I should say. Uh, another one is something else I'm going to read from tonight. This is the linguistic key to the New Testament. Uh, this is by Fritz Reinecker. I I refer to uh, I refer to him by name once in a while. He's the fellow that wrote this book. It's very very good. This particular one isn't. Uh, a word study by the words, but this actually goes through the New Testament, and uh, it gets into some of the key Greek words, not all of them, but it also gets into the, the uh, uh, voice tense and mood of verbs and that kind of thing, but very uh, a very easy read, and he sources his material. He goes uh he names the source of of sentences he writes and he's very brief in it and as you can see it's a, it's a small book very portable you could put it with your w w e vine if you got to run quick then uh my my bible is this uh american standard version this is the old and new testaments uh, as i said i'm going to need my reading glasses to read it but i'm uh, see i'm preparing now another thing i would take would be a couple good lexicons um i would take the the uh, liddell and scott if i if i thought my wife could bear the load if i thought mrs griffith could bear i'm just kidding that's what uh, a guy named Walter Williams does. He he uh, fills in for Rush once in a while. He's pretty old now, so I don't know if he has. But I heard him say one time, uh, I don't know if he has recently, but uh, I heard him say one time that he was going to get Mrs. Williams a football helmet for her Christmas present so that uh, she wouldn't, hurt herself and get a concussion if she slipped and fell while she was cleaning uh, the ice off his car windows. So. <laughs> but things were probably different when uh, he was home with Mrs. Williams, and if you notice, Mrs. Griffith isn't here tonight. So, uh, But if she could bear the load, I'd take the Liddell and Scott, but that's a monster. I, I really wouldn't wish that on anyone. Uh, the Arndt ba the Arndt Bauer and Gingrich lexicon is is very good. Uh, it's probably the best lexicon there is. It's a good one to have. There are more compact ones. Um, the Perschbacher lexicon, a more recent work by uh, Wesley Perschbacher, that's very good. Joseph Thayer's an old standard, that's very good. Uh, what else would I take if I just could take a few books? There is a, I'd take a, a, a Greek New Testament, uh, an analytical one that, uh, that is coded with English letters and numbers to, to parse verbs, give the voice, tense, the mood, the, the uh, uh, person, the, um, whether it's singular or plural, uh, nouns, uh, whether they're dative, accusative, that kind of thing. Uh, 
and I need, you know, I can't look at a, a Greek man. I'm not a good enough Greek student to look at a Greek manuscript and from the inflection of each word uh, be able to accurately and consistently discern what uh, what the, the tense, mood, and uh, just from looking at the inflection on on the verb, because that's, uh, Greek is a very inflectional language, so I can't look at a, a verb. And although I can, I have somewhat of a an aptitude for it, but but uh, tell for certain whether what uh, tense, voice, and mood, and person, and number it is. So I use a Greek New Testament with uh, little. English codes on it, like uh, similar to what Bible Hub does uh, with their, they have an inner linear that, that uh, has those things with Greek text. And what's nice uh, about that is you can click on uh, the Greek text and, and you've got a, a very basic lexicon right there. But out in the woods, we won't have internet, so I would carry that. I would also take uh, a little volume, uh, Dana and Manti, uh, I'm not sure just what it's called, but it's an old classic. What it is, it's a grammar of the New Testament Greek, and it's, it's standardly, at least it used to be used in uh, Bible colleges and seminaries. It is the classic. It's about... This size, it's it's thicker than this, but uh, I would take that, and I would take Unger's Bible Dictionary. And with those tools, uh, I could get a lot of study in. And uh, I'm glad my library is larger, but there could be a, a time that would come when I'd have to choose. So, in any case... Uh, let's look at Romans 2, verses 14 and 15 again. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. And so people in their thinking now, if their conscience becomes aware of things that are evil, uh, they often become very, their thinking becomes very relative and they're actually uh, injuring their conscience when they will refuse the absolutes of truth. And they, they think very rel relatively, and they uh, rationalize. They make excuses. And in any case, Fritz Reinecker on this word, sunidesis, uh, in this particular verse, he writes, or wrote, past tense, Sunedesis, conscience. Paul regarded conscience as performing in the Gentile world roughly the same function as was performed by the law among the Jews. And I think that that is helpful to make sense out of what Paul wrote in uh, Romans 2, verses 14 and 15. And so, again, let me read that from, from Fritz. Sunedesis, conscience. Paul regarded conscience as performing in the Gentile world roughly the same function as was performed by the law among the Jews. Norms and standards, right and wrong, a scale of values. Okay, you can turn with me to Titus chapter 1. Titus 
Titus chapter 1. And uh, we have some information regarding the conscience here. Uh, and let me, I, I meant to actually read from W. E. Vine. Something, so let's get that out of the way. He has some great material on the conscience. And uh, then we will move on to Titus chapter 1. W. E. Vine writes of conscience, sune desis, literally a knowing with, soon uh, with oida, to know, that is, a co-knowledge with oneself, the witness born to one's conduct by conscience, that faculty which we, uh, that faculty by which we apprehend the will of God as that which is designed to govern to govern our lives. Hence, A, the sense of guiltiness before God, Hebrews 10, verse 2. B, that process of thought which distinguishes what it considers morally good or bad, commending the good, condemning the bad, and so prompting to do the former and avoid the latter, Romans 2, 15, bearing witness with God's law. Uh, Romans 9, 1, uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 12, acting in a certain way because the conscience requires it, Romans 13, 5, so as not to cause scruples of conscience in another, 1 Corinthians 10, 28, and 29. We've, we've studied all these. Not calling a thing in question unnecessarily as if conscience demanded it, 1 Corinthians 10, 25, 27. Studied that years ago. Uh, commending oneself to every man's conscience. We studied that last week. To every man's conscience in the sight of God. That is, we appeal to every person's conscience with the word of reconciliation. The, the word of the cross. The gospel. Uh, let's look here. Uh, the phrase conscience toward God in 1 Peter 2.9 signifies a conscience or perhaps here a consciousness so controlled by the apprehension of God's presence that the person realizes that griefs are to be borne in accordance with his will. Hebrews 9.9 9 teaches that sacrifices under the law could not perfect a person so that he could regard himself as free from guilt. And uh, I'll add to that that in Hebrews 9, verse 12, uh, how much more will the blood of Christ, that is his substitutionary death uh, on our behalf, uh, how much more will Christ's substitutionary death Purify the conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The living God. We are designed to be presenting ourselves as living sacrifices in Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. And that means that uh, the sacrificial offerings in the Levitical ritual system, actually the Aaronic uh, ritual system, and those sacrifices are over and done. And what we do now is we present our bodies a living sacrifice. In other words, we make ourselves available to the Word of God so that our minds are not conformed to this world or to this age, but transformed. Uh, and our, the transformation process takes place as we continue to assimilate the Word of God. It's all about the Word of God. 
And I, you know, when people say, well, doctrine is, is doctrine really isn't the issue. Doctrine is the issue. It is absolutely the issue. And there are many things involved in our application of doctrine, our application of the Word of God, but doctrine is the issue. It is the foundation of the spiritual life. And it is the means by which we uh, get free and remain free from deception. In Psalm 119, verse 130, the entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. That is to the to the seducible, to the one who can, uh, the one who is vulnerable to deception. That's what what simple in the English means, uh, in the in the Hebrew, the the one who is vulnerable to deception. And the word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, verse 105. And in uh, Job 12, verse 23, I have esteemed the words of your lips more than my necessary food. And in, uh, that's uh, Job 23, 12. Deuteronomy 8, 3 Matthew 4.4, 4, it was quoted by Christ from Deuteronomy in Matthew 4.4 4, uh, when he was under his threefold uh, trial of uh, being examined by Satan. And it's, uh, that's recorded in, Mar or in Luke 4.4 4 as well. Uh, Deuteronomy 8.3, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In John seventeen seventeen, sanctify them. This was Jesus praying in the upper room discourse. Sanctify them or set them apart. He was praying on behalf of his disciples. Set them apart through your truth. Your word is truth. God's word contains the absolutes by which we are to live. I, I need to get rid of rid of uh, Mr. Vine and back to the Bible here. But, uh, turn with me to Psalm 119. I want to. I meant I want to mention a verse that has wowed me throughout throughout my years. I have known Christ, and it still wows me today. It wowed me just this week, and it wowed me this morning when I considered it. Psalm 119, it's toward the end of the psalm. It is uh, Psalm 119, and re remember the author of, of Psalm 119 is believed by many to be a young captive who uh, walked on that death march. What was a death march for many after the Chaldeans had uh, destroyed Jerusalem and uh, inside Jerusalem, conditions were absolutely horrifying for uh, 18 months when Jerusalem was under siege, so much so that, that uh, mothers were murdering their own babies uh, and eating them for food. It was an a unbelievable horror. And then when Nebuchadnezzar... Uh, to, started to take captives. He took these, many of them, uh, very young children, and they were chained neck to neck. And they were uh, thirsty, and, and some died of thirst, some died of hunger, starva starvation. Uh, they were raped. They were mutilated. They were... Uh, they were made the 
they were they were made the laughing stock. They were they were caused to entertain the Chaldeans at nighttime uh, by reciting promises from God's word, and they were and the Chaldeans were basically mocking them. You can find this from the internal evidence in in, in the songs, and we've been through some of it. But so imagine. This writer chained neck to neck with, with someone else in pain, under persecution, in hunger, in thirst. Uh, some of these, uh, both male and female, were raped by their captors. And in Psalm 119, verse 161, the psalmist writes, Princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your words. What a precious verse. If you become subject to the slavery of global tyranny, be free in your mind, in your heart of hearts. Be spiritually free. Follow the principle of Galatians 5.1. It was for the sake of freedom. That is, it was because of the principle of freedom that Christ died. And uh, don't be again under the yoke of bondage. Don't be uh, in your spiritual life as you function in your spiritual life. Don't be in your soul, in the thinking processes of your soul. Do not be subject to your own sin nature or the sin nature of others, no matter how you may be enslaved in the world as our nation is judged. And let's uh, close down this session with a word of prayer, and we'll continue our study. Father, we thank you for your blessing upon us, your blessing upon our nation. We thank you that we are blessed by the promises of your word in spite of how things go in the world. Of course, we pray for improved world conditions, but we pray in a greater way with thanksgiving for the fact that we can be of good cheer, we can be confident, because in John 16, verse 33, your Son has overcome the world. And it is in the name of your Son, Jesus, we close this session with prayer. Amen.